Hi, I'm Frank Lavallo, host of Novel Conversations. Before we start the show, we'd like to thank Visible Voice Books for sponsoring the Novel Conversations giveaway, which gives listeners a chance to win all eight classic novels featured in our fifth season. You can enter through our Novel Conversations Facebook page or tweet us at novel underscript converse, that's C-O-N-V-E-R-S, or head to our website blog, thefrontporchpeople.com backslash blog. Visible Voice Books is our local go-to for delving into our favorite books in a relaxed, inviting environment. And if you're not here in Cleveland, Ohio, you can always support Visible Voice Books by shopping online at visiblevoicebooks.com. Visible Voice Books. Without literature, life is hell. All right, up next, Novel Conversations. I'm Frank Lavallo, and this is Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. For each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This Novel Conversation is about White Fang by Jack London, and I'll be joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Phil Setnick. Elizabeth, Phil, hello. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. It's good to be here. Now, before we start our conversation, let me give a brief summary of the novel White Fang. White Fang was written by Jack London and published serially in Outing Magazine from May to October in 1906. White Fang is the story of the wolf dog, White Fang, and his early life in the Yukon Territories. It's also the story of the men in his life, the bad owners, the indifferent owners, and finally the understanding owner who saves his life. How White Fang relates to his environment, other dogs, the wolves and the men in his life, and how he learns the rules of the wild and the rules of men, eventually becoming a trusted and beloved pet, make up the bulk of our novel. Elizabeth, let's get started. The novel is called White Fang, but we don't really meet White Fang until almost about a quarter of the way into the novel. How does this novel really start? Two mushers are carrying what we find out to be a man in his coffin across the Yukon Territory, and it turns out they're delivering him to wherever he needs to be delivered. They've been out on the trail for a while. They're in trouble. They are being stalked by a pack of hungry wolves. Very hungry wolves. There's a famine in the land. Right. So they're being stalked by this pack of wolves. Henry and Bill are characters, and they have their sled team, and they're also aware of the fact that they're slightly unprepared for this. They're down to their last three rounds of ammunition in their gun. And they only have six of their dogs left on the team. Exactly. So every night when they get up in the morning to break camp, they're missing another sled dog. And they realize that what is happening, they actually see this one day, what is happening is there's a she-wolf in this pack of wolves, and she is coming into the camp, and she is luring away his sled team. One at a time. One at a time in a sort of ambush. She's luring away these sled dogs who come to follow her. And then once they sort of get out of reach, the wolf pack comes in and attacks them and eats them. Elizabeth, the way this novel sets up these two men, they're in quite dire straits. And yet I never get the sense from them that they're really panicked. Well, certainly Henry is somewhat under control, but there is some panic building in Bill. True. And every night when they make their camp, not only do they worry for their dogs, but they can actually see the eyes of the wolves peering through the darkness, lit up by the flame, just watching them and waiting. And every night the wolves move just a little closer. Yes, they do. And they're a little less afraid of the fire. And every day Bill is getting a little more vocal about the fact that this may not end well for them. And Phil, it doesn't end well for them, does it? It does not. Uh, After about four or five days into their journey? One morning when they break camp, they actually see there's a she-wolf comes near and draws one of their dogs out to her. And this was their lead dog. Exactly. So they see their sled dog run out to this ambush, and and Bill sort of loses it here. He grabs their gun with their last three rounds of ammunition. He feels if he can get rid of the she-wolf, who appears to be the leader of this pack, or at least the brains of the pack, they might have a fighting chance to survive. Right. Henry tries to dissuade him from this, but it's no good. So Bill goes out into the woods to try and kill the she-wolf, and we don't see what happens. But Phil, Henry hears what happens. Yep. We hear a shot and two more quick shots, so we know that Bill was out of ammunition. And then there's a sound of one ear, that's the dog, presumably being attacked. And then there's some yelping, and then there's complete silence. Which to me was one of the real first signs of how tough life is up there. Henry never even looked back. He knew what happened. Bill was done. There's nothing he can do for him. And the only thing he could do to save himself was to keep going. 
and what's Henry's plan? He does come up with a plan to get out of there quickly, doesn't he? Right. Now he's in worse straits because he doesn't have a partner to help him build the fire and keep these wolves away. And he's down to three dogs. Down to three dogs. He's got this sled. He's got this casket on it. So he winches up the casket into some trees in the forest so he doesn't have to haul it anymore in his sled and also so that the wolves won't get it. It'll be safe. I was a little bit amazed that even in the middle of all this peril, and he's actually now going to have to fight for his life, he stops and does his job. He does his job, exactly. He protects the body in the casket before trying to escape for his life. Exactly. So this opening part of the story closes with Henry in camp. He's built a circle of fire around himself to keep the wolves at bay. He realizes he can't go on. All of his dogs have been lured away and killed. The fires are dying. He can't leave the circle of fire to get more firewood, or the wolves will be on him. I think you remarked on his little alarm clock that he devised himself from falling asleep. Elizabeth, what was that alarm clock? Talk about having to heat up. You had to constantly throw something burning at the wolves to keep them away. So he had to stay awake. Well, it's hard to do that after three or four days of mushing all day. So he tied a piece of rope to his hand, and then he would light the other end of the rope on fire. Then he let himself go to sleep, and when that rope burned his hand, that was time to wake up. To put a little more wood on the fire and relight the rope. And he did this all night. I can imagine, you know, just lighting a match and holding it just a little bit close to my finger, and I realized I wouldn't make it in the Yukon Territory. You'd be one of those poor dogs that was lured off. Yes, I would. And as the end comes for Henry, this was the only scene that, to me, didn't really ring true. Well, it ends with, basically, the cavalry coming in. Right, literally, at the last moment, the fire's gone, the wolves are just about ready to grab Henry. Right, they're inches from him. They're just about ready to devour him. And they hear the mushing of a troop of men coming through on sleds, and the wolves disperse, and Henry, literally, at the last moment, is saved. That one scene really doesn't work for me. Throughout this entire novel, some of the insights into animal behavior and man's behavior towards animals was amazing, but this one scene just seemed too serendipitous to me, too contrived. Elizabeth? I'll give it to you. But to me, there's one a little bit later that... Was even worse? Yeah, even worse to me. Well, we'll save that, and you remind me of it when we come to that scene. All right, with the rescue of Henry, this is the end of part one of our novel, and we now move into part two, which is really the story of the she-wolf. The novel really changes perspective here. Tell me a little bit about the she-wolf in this part of the story. Well, essentially the famine breaks. They find moose and they find squirrels and things so they can eat, but it's also mating season. And then the she-wolf, the one that was luring all the other dogs out, is now apparently the most wanted of the wolves. And there's quite a mating dance which involves the death of two of the wolves before old One-Eye, the oldest and the strongest and most scarred of the wolves, wins the right to run with the she-wolf. And they go off, and they have their mating ritual, and then what happens, Phil? Well, the she-wolf, we learn, is pregnant because she's looking for a den or someplace to have her puppies. This is what we realize in the end. We learn that one eye is clueless. And this search goes on for a couple of days. Jack London writes how she knew she was looking for something, but she wasn't really sure what she wanted. But she would check out this hole, check out this cave. She was really trying to find a birthing nest. And she does. And she gives birth to a litter of pups. You know, before we talk about her litter, though, let's talk a little bit about the she-wolf, because we learn a few things about her. First, we learn that she's not a full wolf. She's actually half wolf, half dog. Her mother was a dog. Right. Her father was a wolf, and she apparently had spent some time with men in a camp like this. Mm Mm-hmm. She and One-Eye come across an Indian camp, and to One-Eye's dismay, she's sort of drawn to this camp of men which, of course, the wolf wants nothing to do with. Jack London describes it as certain sounds were familiar to her, certain smells were familiar to her. So we get the impression she's been in a camp before. In any event, she finds her den where she's comfortable. She has the litter. Three or four pups, I think, in the litter, something like that. She's protective of them against all comers, including One-Eye, who she's not so sure about now because wolf fathers have been known to eat their offspring. So it's amazing the savage nature that comes out of her. I mean, one eye comes near and she gashes him right down the face. And again, Jack London tells us that this is some sort of instinctual knowledge that she has, that father wolves sometimes in the past have attacked baby wolves. Right. She's not 100% sure why, but it's something she feels. We should point out that this book is really written from the perspective of the animals. Certainly at the point where we are now. Yeah, absolutely. So you're learning as they're learning. But One-Eye doesn't completely abandon his role as father to these pups. No. Actually, he turns out to be a, a pretty good wolf father, I would say. He goes out and hunts during the day and brings Kill back. But as happens frequently throughout this story, a famine hits. And some of the pups die. In fact, they all die except for one. 
And this forces Wan-Eye to start looking for food in places he wouldn't otherwise look. And he has earlier observed a lynx in the area, which is... Um, a mountain cat or... A, a, a mountain lion, that. right, which has attacked a porcupine, which he was keeping an eye on. He ends up getting that porcupine, but he knows where this lynx lair is. And he knows that the time may come when he's going to have to battle with that lynx because the famine may push him into a desperate move like that. And in the end, that's what happens. One eye was killed in the battle with this lynx, which leaves our she-wolf mother and our pup. The one surviving pup. Right. The she-wolf discovers one eye's body, and she knows what happened. Right. And she walks into that lair. And she doesn't go in there because she knows the danger in there. But she thinks to herself, well, the time may come when I have to go in there because the family gets so bad that I have to risk that. But they don't actually face the lynx now. No. Then we go back to the cave, and we start to get to know the one pup that's left. We're getting a view of the world through his eyes, and it's a very small and controlled world. And it's got three dark walls and one very, very bright white wall, which he knows he is not supposed to venture towards. But Elizabeth, he does see his father, One-Eye, going through this bright space. Well, he did, yeah. And he thinks, well, maybe I should be able to go through these walls as well. But he tests his theory on the other walls first, and sure enough, he tries to go through the one side of the cave, bumps his nose, gets a little scratch, realizes, well, that's not going to work. He tries another side of the wall, bumps into that, and comes to the conclusion, well, maybe one eye can go through these walls, but apparently I can't. (laughs) Right. But Phil, there does come a time when he has to make for the entrance of the cave. Here's the passage from the book. But there were other forces at work in the cub, the greatest of which was growth. Instinct and law demanded of him obedience, but growth demanded disobedience. His mother, in fear, impelled him to keep away from the white wall. In the end, one day fear and obedience were swept away by the rush of life the cub straddled and sprawled toward the entrance. Then Phil, Elizabeth, once our wolf cub makes it out of his cave for the first time, he basically goes through what I call some Disney-esque chapters where he learns to walk, he learns to run, his mother teaches him how to swim, he realizes that live things are good to eat, but sometimes if it's a big live thing, it can hurt you. And you feel like this is a joyful little creature. It's funny to know that this could grow up to be a man-eating wolf. And that's really how part two of our novel ends, and we move right into part three. They meet a man. Certainly She-Wolf has met men before, but this is the first sighting that our pup has had of mankind. Phil? Right. The pup comes out of the cave one day, and he's taking his usual route down to get a drink of water from the stream. And he smells something. And he comes upon a small camp of he doesn't know what. They're men. Before him, sitting silently on their haunches, were five live things, the like of which he had never seen before. It was his first glimpse of mankind. Yeah, what I think is amazing about that in the next paragraph, the cub doesn't know whether to run or to stay. It says, the cub had never seen man, yet the instinct concerning man was his. A great awe descended upon him, and then this next line, it was amazing to me, He was beaten down to movelessness by an overwhelming sense of his own weakness and littleness. Which is such a foreshadowing because these men are going to beat him to movelessness on multiple occasions. Right, here was a mastery and a power, something far and away beyond him. And he knows it. He knows it instinctively. Right, no other way to know it. But Elizabeth, let me ask you, he doesn't stay movelessness for long, does he? No, because he is spied by the men who turn out to be Indians. So one of the Indians walks over to him, and again, by instinct, he bares his teeth at him. And the Indians laugh at him, and they see his little teeth, and they say, Look, look at the white fangs. Finally, our pup has a name. But interestingly enough, the she-wolf we learn her name now as well. Well, we do, because White Fang gets into a little trouble right away. Right. As the Indian reaches down to pet White Fang, London writes, You experienced two great impulsions, to yield and to fight. The resulting action was a compromise. He did both. He yielded till the hand almost touched him. Then he fought, his teeth flashing in a snap that sank them into the hand. The next moment he received a clout alongside the head that knocked him over on his side. And it's the yelping and crying from White Fang that brings the mother, She-Wolf. Right. She had heard the cry of her cub and was dashing to save him. And it's great because the cub knew what that cry was. And with the last long wail that had in it more of triumph than grief, he ceased his noise and waited for the coming of his mother, of his ferocious and indomitable mother. So the cub knows these things. Whatever they are, they're in for it now because here's mom. And as she bounds into this little clearing to save her puppy, the cry went up from one of the men. Kiche was what he uttered. It was an exclamation of surprise. The cub felt his mother wilting at the sound. 
Kiche, the man cried again, this time with sharpness and authority. And then the cub saw his mother, the she-wolf, the fearless one, crouching down till her belly touched the ground, whimpering, wagging her tail, making peace signs. Elizabeth, what's the story here? It turns out these are the Indians with whom she was born. Her parents were part of their dog pack, and she lived with them. And so they knew this to be their dog. She actually finds her prior owner, Grey Beaver. And so now Grey Beaver decides he's going to recapture his old pet, Kiche, as well as her pup, White Fang, and they're all going to go back to the Indian camp. Right. And they understand animal nature as well. They don't tie up White Fang. They know he's a pup, and they know he's going to be wherever his mother is. So they tie up his mother, and in so doing, they get both animals at once, and they only have to tie up Kiche long enough to let the instinct of the wild die down in her and the domesticated dog instinct come back to her. Right. She now ignores the call of the wild in response to the call of man. Right. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about White Fang's experiences in the Indian camp. But before we find out what happens to him at the camp and what happens to his mother and the rest of our story, let's take a quick break to talk about a wonderful podcast that I think you'll really enjoy hearing more about. It's the Professional Book Nerds Podcast. If you enjoy listening to novel conversations, I think you'll really enjoy this podcast too. The Professional Book Nerds podcast offers up book recommendations and interviews your favorite authors every Monday and Thursday. Both Jill Grunenwald and Adam Sokol have spent their careers in the book world and have an inside look on exciting books you're going to love. In addition to their twice-a-week episodes, each month they preview the best new books coming out you're sure to love. They're not just book nerds. They're professional book nerds. Visit professionalbooknerds.com and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check them out on our sister station, evergreenpodcast.com. All right, back to our discussion about the novel White Fang by Jack London. Elizabeth, before we took our break, we left our two main characters, Quiche the She-Wolf and White Fang our wolf pup. They had now entered into the camp of the Indians, and with Grey Beaver, who was the owner of Quiche, and of course now the owner of White Fang. Quiche appears to be somewhat okay with being back in this camp, and for White Fang, it's a learning experience. He's learning now the laws of man. In fact, Jack London writes it this way. As his mother Quiche had rendered her allegiance to them at the first cry of her name, so he was beginning to render his allegiance. But things don't go very well for White Fang while he's in this camp, do they? Well, one dog, Lip Lip, decides that he's wanting to fight White Fang whenever he can. And as Lip Lip invariably won, he enjoyed it hugely. It became his chief delight in life, as it became White Fang's chief torment. But this is again where London starts to tell us about the strength of White Fang. The effect upon White Fang was not to cow him. In fact, he writes, yet a bad effect was produced. He became malignant, morose, his temper been savage by birth, but it became more savage under this unending persecution. And the next line is... The genial, playful, puppyish side of him found little expression, and we will almost never see that side of White Fang again. But Elizabeth, this persecution by Lip Lip is not the worst thing that happens to White Fang while he's in the camp. He's got another tragedy to survive. Gray Beaver owes a debt to three eagles, another Indian in camp, and to satisfy that debt, he trades away Quiche to three eagles, who's leaving on a trip. Which is a huge blow to White Fang, because despite the torment he's getting from Lip Lip, there was always his mother to go back to. And White Fang learned that he could trick Lip Lip into getting into the range of Kiche's leash, and Kiche would give Lip Lip the beating that White Fang couldn't yet give him. That's right. White Fang becomes very skilled and cunning, becomes very sly in the way he battles Lip Lip and some of the other dogs that are tormenting him in the camp. He does not attack openly. He knows he has to quickly go in and make any attack and get out because the whole pack of dogs led by Lip Lip will be on him quickly. And he learns that dogs like to snarl and bark before they attack. So he learns just to attack. Which I loved. It, it kind of struck me as if White Fang had watched so many movies where the guy pulls out a gun and announces, this is the end of your life, which of course is all the time that the good guy needs to take them by surprise and get rid of them before... Right. Why don't they just shoot James Bond instead of tying him down, bringing in a laser, some way they're going to go and go through an airplane hangar? Just kill him. Yeah. Well, White Fang was not going to be caught that way. But Quiche is gone. What happens now to White Fang? Well, when White Fang saw Kiche being taken off, this was a knife through his heart that nothing so far had been. So he, of course, tries to take off after them. Uh, 
then, of course, Grey Beaver captures him and gives him a beating like he's never experienced in his life. And he truly was within an inch of his life. Grey Beaver knew how far to beat him that he wouldn't quite die, but it was going to make an impression. And it's because of this beating and because of the treatment at the hands of Grey Beaver that White Fang transfers all his allegiance to Grey Beaver. And he really does become this man's dog. Right. It's amazing. Despite the pain that he inflicted, that pain is also equal to power. And his instinct responded to power. So Grey Beaver was now his leader. And there comes a time when camp breaks up and they decide to go to a local fort. So White Fang decides this is going to be his opportunity. He's going to stay behind and stay in the wild. He goes out into the woods and he hides as Grey Beaver is calling for him and calling for him. He just stays where he is and he waits. Which was tough for him because Grey Beaver was his leader. But the call of the wild at that point was stronger. Stronger than the call of the man. Yes. Exactly. And he waits until he's confident that the Indians have left. And he returns to the now empty campground and he quickly... Very quickly. ...realizes that he's not quite sure why it is that he's here. My name is Cindy Burnett. And each week I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler-free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else. The importance of the cover design, why they included various aspects of the story, personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out. And he suddenly feels a sense of loneliness out here in the wild. It's a very poignant moment. He actually goes into the circle where Grey Beaver's teepee had once stood and lies down on that circle because the ground still has some of the scent from Grey Beaver and his family. It gets dark and cold and windy, and suddenly he realizes, I'm really just a pup. I don't know what I'm doing out here. Maybe I can still find them. It was one thing when I had my mom out here with me, but now I'm on my own. And he runs for 30 hours straight. Ah, the endurance of a wolf. And he actually does find the camp again. But Grey Beaver is going to the local fort. He's got goods to trade. He's been hunting and collecting pelts all winter. He wants to go to the camp and trade his goods. This is when White Fang sees a white man for the first time. There are buildings, there's machinery, and he realizes that life is literally bigger and the white man seems to be able to control it all. White Fang was terrified and very impressed by the teepees in the Indian camp when he first encountered them. These must be gods that can erect these huge things. And if you think a teepee is something, wait till you see a four-story building in the town. Right. What is happening here is there's a steamboat that comes in and it's disgorging all these gold seekers. Right, this is the Yukon Gold Rush time. Exactly. So they're arriving with their dogs, but they're not treated as dogs. They're pampered pets. Exactly. So just as Grey Beaver's preying upon these novices who need his wares, White Fang is preying upon these dogs that come off the steamship, and he quickly gains a reputation in town as the fiercest fighting dog. And he's now actually called the Fighting Wolf. Which is not good, because it draws the attention of a man called Beauty Smith. Beauty Smith. What's he about? Beauty Smith is named Beauty, of course, because he is anything but. And he's a mean, horrible person. He wants to own this fighting wolf because he's a dogfighter. So he has to buy him from Grey Beaver. So Beauty Smith comes up with a plan, and this, to me, is a weak link in the book. Phil, what was Beauty Smith's plan? Well, basically, Beauty Smith is going to ply Grey Beaver with whiskey. He just shows up one day with a jug of whiskey. It takes a few days to get all the money that he's made selling his pelts. He's spent now on whiskey. It seems a little improbable. Yeah, it just seems... But in any event, there's Beauty Smith with another jug for him and saying, I'll buy White Fang off you for... This last pint of whiskey. Mm. Here's a man, Grey Beaver, who knows how to deal with wolves, but he couldn't really deal with a wolf in man's clothing. Yeah, right. But it's not that simple for White Fang. His loyalties don't transfer with his business arrangement. It takes, I think, three times, and each time he's savagely beaten. And the third time... But by Beauty Smith, not by Grey Beaver. He realizes that Grey Beaver is not going to step in. He's not going to prevent this. And there is a sense that Beauty Smith will beat him till he's dead. He's not trying to break his spirit. In fact, he pens him up and turns him into a fighting dog. Eventually, Beauty Smith decides he's got to take this dog on the road, but finally White Fang does meet his match, an English bulldog. An unusual dog for these parts. White Fang doesn't know quite what to make of him. The dog just sort of stands there looking at White Fang. And, of course, the wolf way of fighting is to jump in, slash at your enemy, and you jump back again until you can go for the throat. And one of White Fang's strengths was that he had learned never to be knocked off his feet. If you get off your feet, you die. But how do you knock a bulldog off his feet? 
That's right, Elizabeth. His trick was that he would knock the other dog off his feet. But you've got a little guy standing no more than a foot off the ground. There's no way you can get underneath this bulldog to tip him over. So during White Fang's confusion, the bulldog gets a bite on him. Right. Once he closes his jaws on your throat, he never lets go. Basically, he's going to suffocate you by crushing your windpipe. How does White Fang get out of this situation? Well, he doesn't really get out of it. Once again, man has to step in. But there's a big crowd around watching this dog fight. A sled pulls up with two men on it, Whedon Scott and his dog musher, Matt. He steps in to break it up. He is enraged about what these men are doing, calling them cowards and beasts and pushing them aside. And as we come to learn later, both Whedon Scott and his guy, Matt, train and run sled dogs. They care about these dogs, so Whedon Scott and Matt take White Fang, and they're going to see what they can do with him. And they recognize him to be a wolf more than a dog, so they know that there's little potential for training him. But they're just not going to let him die. Well, Phil, are they successful in rescuing and rehabilitating White Fang? They are, slowly. He does learn to trust Scott. And he actually becomes their pet. To everyone, including White Fang's amazement. And he transfers his loyalty now to Scott when he's out in the camp with the other dogs. He quickly learns that these dogs belong to Scott. Therefore, White Fang isn't supposed to kill them, which is what he would do normally. Right. He realizes the things that belong to Scott, the cabin, his property, are things that he's supposed to protect. And he does. But in a different way than he did with Grey Beaver. He'll stay up all night to keep watch outside the cabin. Whereas with Grey Beaver, he never did that. He just knew no one else was allowed to touch it. If he saw it, he would do something about it. But here he's taking an active role in caring for his god. But there does come a time when Weed and Scott has to leave the Yukon Territory, and he's going to go back to his home. He can't take a wolf with him back to San Francisco. He tries to leave him with Matt. Phil, how successful is that? Well, as Scott is leaving on the steamship, there's White Fang on the deck of the boat. Exactly. Just as White Fang had once tracked down Grey Beaver, he now tracks down Weed and Scott, and Scott realizes, I can't leave this dog. Well, how does he like San Francisco? Well, he doesn't like it. But fortunately for White Fang, Scott lives outside of the city. Probably known as Napa Valley now. Perhaps. And he lives there on this estate with his wife and children, but also his family. His father's a judge. And as you might imagine, they're appalled when he brings the full-grown wolf onto their property. A snarling, growling, full-grown wolf. And this is yet another amazing set of scenes where the instinct of animal gives in to the instinct of man. The pet dog wins out over the wild wolf. Yeah, but I really think London is saying that love wins out. So, Elizabeth, we have one more trial for White Fang to go through before he can live out the rest of his life fat and happy on this estate. You want to tell us a little bit about Jim Hall? Jim Hall is a notorious murderer who has just escaped from prison. The people on Whedon Scott's farm are particularly concerned because the judge, Whedon's father, sentenced this man, and he swore if he ever got out that he'd come back and get him. And sure enough, he gets out, and sure enough, he comes back. He does. Well, they don't know this yet, but they're worried about this. Fortunately, unbeknownst to everyone else on the farm, Alice, Whedon's wife, after everyone's in bed, has been coming downstairs and letting White Fang into the front hall. And that turns out to be quite fortuitous. Right. Prior to this, White Fang was always kept outside. So once Jim Hall shows up at the Scott house looking for the judge, he finds White Fang instead. Yes. And here's the passage in the book. On one such night, while all the house slept, White Fang awoke and lay very quietly. And very quietly he smelled the air and read the message it bore of a strange god's presence. Into his ears came sounds of the strange god's movements. White Fang burst into no furious outcry. It was not his way. So all that White Fang had learned about how to fight, how to be cunning, how to be quiet, how to not announce yourself before your attack, comes into play right here at the foot of the stairs. No snarling, no bristling, no warnings. Just attack. Right. And he attacks Jim Hall, and he takes him down. Judge Whedon is now the biggest fan of who is now known to be the Blessed Wolf. All right, he went from the Fighting Wolf to now he's the Blessed Wolf. Right. And does he live happily ever after, our White Fang? As a matter of fact, he does. And that's our story of White Fang by Jack London. Now, of course, Elizabeth, Phil, in a book of this length, we can't get to every moment or to every great quote. So now's your opportunity to give us a good quote or give us a moment that we haven't had a chance to touch upon. Phil? To me, it struck me as a great study on the law. White Fang is a very upright, noble, and a law-abiding character in this book. What he wanted to do is find out what the law was in the wild, in camp, on his master's farm, so he could follow it. And he felt as long as he was following the law and being just, that justice would be meted out to him. 
Right, and that would give him some level of happiness if he was doing what was right. That meant he would be left alone, and that was good enough for him. It's funny to say this about a wolf, but he never makes a value judgment about the law. He just wants to know what the law is so he can follow the rules. Right. And what about for you, Elizabeth? Was there a moment or a line in here that you want to mention? All of that, and then you add on the constant battle between instincts and needs. If he followed his instincts all the time, he would have snarled, he would have growled, he would have bit man's hand when he wanted to because this person had been mean to him. But those laws, contrary to his instinct, did produce some sort of peace. So he constantly had to battle that. And so do we. To me, when I first started reading this, I was thinking, well, this is going to be a man versus nature story. But it really changed, and what it became for me was about White Fang and his two natures. He had the wolf nature, and he had the dog nature. And the wolf nature was the call of the wild, and the dog nature was the call of man. And he's torn. And the dog nature wins out for White Fang, and for me, that's what made this a very interesting novel to read. And it's hard not to add a religious aspect to it in that, of course, the dog looks at man as gods. So in his mind, these are all powerful, all-knowing people. So there's some interesting parallels in there. Right. It makes me think, what do we owe our gods? What do we owe our masters? And then what do our masters owe to us? Phil, Elizabeth, do you have another moment or passage you'd like to recount? We talked earlier about the lynx finding a porcupine, and then one eye who was White Fang's father eventually finding the porcupine, too. Well, it's a great story because the way the porcupine defends himself is to turn himself into a ball of quills. There is no soft underbelly. He keeps himself close and tight, and the animal knows this, and it's a waiting game. They have to sit and watch and figure out, he is going to give up in 10 minutes, so I can wait. Or is this going to be four hours, and maybe I'm better off just going off? And the porcupine, once he's closed himself up, doesn't know if they're still there or not. So he's got to weigh that. And so London describes it like this. Half an hour passed, an hour, and nothing happened. The ball of quills might have been a stone for all it moved. The lynx might have been frozen to marble, and old one-eye might have been dead. Yet all three animals were key to a tenseness of living that was almost painful. So if you were walking through the woods, it would all seem quiet and still, and absolutely nothing was happening. And yet there is a fierce battle going on. I thought that was great. I also thought it was a great moment. Phil, do you have another line or moment you want to share? Just a short passage. When the Indians have broken camp, and White Fang is deciding this is his chance to be free, and he's hidden in the woods, and he's waited till the Indians have left, and he comes back to the empty camp, and he realizes that he's alone now. And he realized that he was hungry, and he remembered pieces of meat and fish that had been thrown at him. Here was no meat, nothing but a threatening and edible silence. His bondage had softened him, irresponsibility had weakened him. He had forgotten how to shift for himself. So here his freedom is only a couple hours old, and he was quickly going to decide that he had to get back to man. Very good. And actually, my passage has to do with the law. Here's the passage about White Fang learning the law. The aim of life was meat. Life itself was meat. Life lived on life. There were the eaters and the eaten. The law was eat or be eaten. He did not formulate the law in clear, set terms or moralize about it. He did not even think about the law. He merely lived the law without thinking about it at all. Oh, Frank, that really sums up the whole book. Thanks. You're welcome. And this is where we'll end our conversation today on Jack London's novel, White Fang. Elizabeth, Phil, I want to thank both of you for coming in and having this conversation with me. Thanks, thank Frank. You. We enjoyed it. Yeah, we love being here. I appreciate both of you guys saying that and being here as well. You've been listening to Novel Conversations. Novel Conversations is a production of the Front Porch People. For more information about upcoming Novel Conversations, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app. Or go to our website at thefrontporchpeople.com. And if you like the podcast, don't forget to leave us a review. It really helps. A special thanks to producer Julie Fink. Audio engineers Sean Ruhlhoffman, Eric Coltnow, and Dave Douglas. And executive producer Joan Andrews. We'd also like to thank our researchers, Patrick and Joan Andrews. And I'm your host, Frank Lavallo. Until next time, I hope you find yourself in a novel conversation. My name is Cindy Burnett, and each week I interview at least two traditionally published authors on my podcast, Thoughts from a Page. We talk spoiler-free about their books, so you can listen whether you have read the book or not. And then we delve into things that you most likely won't hear about anywhere else. The importance of the cover design, 
why they included various aspects of the story, personal details about both the books and the author's lives, and so much more. You can find the podcast on every major platform and learn more about it on my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. Thanks so much for checking it out. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.